Written on the pages of the great book of nature lies a truth so profound that it has beckoned men and women throughout the ages to seek its wisdom. We will continue this quest and study many stories of humanity as we search for this light. On this journey, we will examine philosophy, religion, and science to uncover the hidden mysteries behind myth and legend using the symbols of universal Freemasonry. Welcome to Legends of the Craft. Welcome back to Legends of the Craft. I'm here in the studio with Brother Matthias again, and today we're going to be talking about the Foundation series. This is an excellent series of books by Isaac Asimov, a science fiction writer of the 20th century and arguably one of the greatest science fiction writers of all time. So I'm sure a lot of people are going to ask us, Brother Matthias, what does science fiction have to do with Freemasonry? And personally, I would argue it has everything to do with Freemasonry because science fiction, to me, is the most important genre of literature that we have because it's how we imagine our future. So much of the world that we have around us now is a result of young scientists and engineers being inspired by the ideas of science fiction writers and creating the world that was imagined 50 years ago. I think all too often as Masons, we're always looking back, you know, uh, the old stories of the Old Testament, mythological stories of, of the ancient world. But in fact, there are new mythologies today. There's Lord of the Rings, there's Star Wars. These are mythologies, and they have the same archetypes that we find in masonry. So I think it's very easy for us to associate Masonic symbolism and Masonic ideals and virtues with these different stories. So I think what we're trying to say here is that this show isn't only going to look at something from 2,000 years ago or from the past. We're going to be looking forward to, and science fiction is one of these avenues that we can go down in order to apply Masonic symbolism for a new generation of Masons in the 21st century. And I think you can apply that problem of, of consistently looking to the past in Masonry to society at large too, because you'll notice in the recent decades, science fiction is not as popular as it once was. There's something called the golden age of science fiction. It was a period from about the 50s through the 60s where the, the great classics of science fiction were written. And you really don't have the same um, caliber of writers writing science fiction these days, and it's not being consumed at the same rate that it was. So to me, it's, it's almost like our society is mirroring the same problem that we find in mainstream masonry in that we're looking to the past instead of trying to build a new future. Masonry needs to look to the future. You know, the craft isn't what it once was. Numbers are lower, less people are joining, and the people that join aren't satisfied like they were during the golden age of fraternalism. So I think in, in, in many respects, we as a community of Masons need to look to the future. We need to start seeing what can be done in order to point Masonry towards the future, towards its destiny of being a vehicle by which to perfect humanity. And this is the same problem that Isaac Asimov recognized and wrote about in the Foundation series. So for those of you who haven't read the book, we're going to cover some general plot points, but there's really, there's not much in the way of spoilers here. And we hope that if you haven't read the series, that this podcast will get you to go buy the book or download the book and read it or listen to it because it's an excellent series that parallels the stories of not only the Blue Lodge, but of the Scottish Rite and York Rite. So at the beginning of the series, we're introduced to the character Harry Seldon. Harry Seldon lives on Trantor, which is a city planet at the center of the galaxy. And by this time, humanity has conquered trillions of star systems. We've, we've formed a, a massive empire that stretches across the galaxy. And Harry Seldon is what's known as a, as a psychohistorian. He, is, he has perfected a branch of sociological mathematics called psychohistory that's used to predict the movements and trends of society at large on, on massive amounts of, of humans. The more people you have, the more accurate psychohistory is. So when you're looking at the movement of an individual, it's impossible to calculate. But if you have a billion, you can calculate that. If you have a trillion, you can calculate it easier. You have 10 times that, you can even calculate it easier. So the more people you have, the easier it becomes to predict the movements of humanity mathematically. And so in the very first couple of pages, Harry Seldon is, is basically laying out his discovery that 
um, while it seems that the empire is at the peak of its performance, it's in its glory days, Harry Seldon says it's actually on the verge of collapse and that humanity is facing a dark age and that there are two ways through this dark age. One, endure 30,000 years of darkness and despair, or through psychohistory, only endure 1,000 years of darkness until the reestablishment of a great galactic empire, which is better uh, in all ways than the former. Uh, a galactic Empire 2.0, so to say. There's the path of hardship, and there's the easier path, which is more difficult because it's going to have to be worked out perfectly according to these formulas created by him. This harkens us back to Noah and the Flood, a very Masonic story in which one person comes forth and has been informed by God that civilizations come to an end. Everybody thinks he's crazy. Nobody believes it because everything seems fine, just like Harry Seldon in the height of the Galactic Empire, or the perceived height of the Galactic Empire. And what happens is, is that Noah builds a ship that survives the Flood and reestablishes civilization, where Harry Seldon is attempting to do exactly the same thing. So in the Foundation series, this uh, group of people that's attempting to reignite civilization uh, in the chaos of collapse is called the Encyclopedists. And they are basically, they're sent to the far end of, of the galaxy and told to build a repository of all human knowledge so that it can survive uh, the coming catastrophe, which is very similar to what Noah was charged to do by God, was to preserve the, uh, the life of the earth and the traditions of humanity on this ark while God washed away all the unnecessary you know, inhabitants of his universe, or the, the sinners, rather. In Masonry, we'll find different variations of the story, um, either Lamesh or Enoch or different, um, different patriarchs of old erecting columns that can survive either a deluge or a great fiery storm. And these columns are sometimes made of different materials to survive these calamities. But in the columns are stored the seven liberal arts and the history of humanity, essentially the knowledge that came down through the lineage of Adam. And, and interestingly enough, in the story of foundation, there's not one foundation. There are, in fact, two foundations, just like there were two columns set forth to preserve the knowledge of humanity in the Masonic version of the story. You know, Brother Matthias, I really like the fact that you brought up the story of Noah, because Noah is not the only story of a preserver against a deluge. Across human mythology, we find this same motif repeated again and again, that uh, God or, or some very powerful being uh, has caused a crisis to come towards the earth, and there's one person who preserves the knowledge of civilization. You'll find this in Japanese mythology, Chinese mythology. There's certain African tribes that have this mythology. Certain South American civilizations have the same tradition. You know, it's a common mythos in the, in the human memory. And to me, that doesn't mean that, you know, our ancestors just made up the same story over and over again. To me, that's evidence of a very, very deep memory in the genetics of our species. Not only is it a deep genetic memory, but it's something that is quite possibly going to happen again. I mean, the idea of survival is built into every living creature. And survival not only means surviving the calamity, but it's preserving what one already had in order not to have to start again. And so if we look at our craft from this perspective, I mean, clearly it's the duty of masonry to be the preservers of this knowledge, to be the rebuilders of civilization. If we in fact come down from the ancient mysteries, which some people will argue is a fact and other people will say it's just a stretch of the imagination, um, but in my mind uh, there's no doubt that, that there's an ancient lineage to masonry, and within it is this idea of the preservation of knowledge, of, of concepts, of archetypes. And so that we could, in fact, reintroduce these things into society if necessary. We're the torchbearers, carrying this light for a time that it will be needed. Brother Manley P. Hall kind of talks about this idea with the perennial philosophy. This idea that there is a tradition of human wisdom that gets preserved and carried on in the face of calamity, in the face of catastrophe, you know, from culture to culture, that it's, it's somehow preserved by some you know, organization that works across the centuries. 
And that's another idea that Asimov brings up with the foundation is this idea of an institution or an organization that can work across centuries or millennia towards a goal that its individual members will never realize in their lifetime. But they carry that within their ceremonies, their rituals, their creeds, their doctrines, their morals, their virtues. And as Masons, we may not really understand the full capacity, the full power of the craft of our rituals, but we do them because they do something personally for us. But there's a grand work that I don't think many of us can really touch upon because it's either been lost in time or held to a few people. So I'd ask you, Brother Matthias, do you think this is something that has this idea of um, a preservatory tradition in Masonry? Do you think that that was something that was lost recently or has always only been recognized by a few initiates of the craft? That's hard to say, uh, Brother Axel. I mean, I think some people see this element that we're discussing. Other people would, would completely disagree. And, and I think we're all entitled to our own opinions on the matter. But it can't be argued that preservation and survival are not a major part of the Masonic degrees. Whether, no matter what right you're talking about, it's, it's a major concept. And this is something that we really don't think about today in the modern age when everything is at our fingertips. But just how fragile this construct of civilization that we've built up around us is. You know, all of our information, all of our records, our mythologies, all of the imprint of humanity in the 20th and 21st centuries, it's all digital. All it takes is, you know, uh, a slight disturbance in, in the chain of events to cause digital civilization to come to a close. And where, do, where does all of our stories and mythology and progress go then? You know, that's when we would have to revert back to the ancient methods of masonry and restart civilization from there. We would need to use the working tools in such a way as to reignite the passion of masonry, to build buildings, to construct temples in order to... Uh, locate various stars and constellations to know the seasons, to know when to harvest. You know, the Masonic Lodge is a perfect layout for these things. It's almost like an ancient almanac that's been added to, you know, throughout the centuries, like, like a grand project just refining and refining and refining as a backup, you know, in case some catastrophe happens to us that we at least have this um, symbolic tool set by which to organize civilization. And I think it's really interesting that ancient people recognize that civilization is built from symbols first and specific second. The human mind works in such a way that if you apply the symbols, the details will come later. So if civilization was wiped out today, and we just had these Masonic ceremonies, these ideas of working tools, of the seven liberal arts and sciences, which is another one, uh, the very symbols that we find in Lodge, I think then what you would find is people recreating all the details far quicker, just like Harry Seldon's scenario. It'd be a lot easier to have only a thousand years of darkness than 30,000. So if civilization was wiped out, it's not that we're going to recreate it in a year. Masonry would have to do its magic for a long period, but we wouldn't have 30,000 years, only 1,000 years of darkness. I think that's a really important point about what Asimov is trying to say with the Foundation series is that, you know, whenever a major catastrophe like that rears its head and, and first of all most people aren't going to see it but second of all there is no good option like either path is filled with you know darkness chaos and violence one's just shorter than the other but a thousand years isn't exactly short to a human lifetime but that's evolution isn't it it's it's adapting to our surroundings um to our environment easier that's what an adaptable species does so masonry in a sense makes us more adaptable by giving us this oral tradition that can be used to reestablish civilization now in the book foundation uh, again it, it covers several hundred years um, as the galactic empire starts to collapse and it moves into this this uh, this dark age and in the course of this, the revival created by Terminus, by this great encyclopedia formed by Harry Seldon, there's different phases. So first there was the cycle historians. They, they prepared everything before the collapse. And then there was the encyclopedias that you mentioned, uh, Brother uh, Axel, and, and the collecting of all the information of humanity. After which came the mayors. So now that the empire was cut off from Terminus, leaders emerged in order to establish control. And what they did was they used technology 
uh, in order to wow the savages between quotes. So I think that for me is a really interesting part of the story because it shows that the first uh, work in pulling us out of the dark age is to establish some form of religion. And in this case, they do it through technology, through nuclear technology that nobody else can duplicate. They form a, a technocratic religion around this technology that's um, been released right when people are starting to descend into, you know, the chaos of the empire falling apart. Their old technologies don't work as well. The old methods are not available to them. And because everybody has become so specialized, they don't know how to build this stuff for themselves. So all of a sudden, you've got the encyclopedists on Terminus who are starting to produce this technology. They, it's uh, the the traders, I believe, are, are the third group to arise on Terminus who start bringing the plan forward. And they do that by reintroducing religion. Now, I think that's really interesting from a Masonic perspective because that's what we're charged to do as well. Well, if we look back to the ancient world, you know, to Egypt and to Rome and to Greece and to all these various civilizations, don't we see the same type of thing? There are these magicians, so to say, these priests that are performing miracles. Uh, many times they're, they're just using, um, back then, elaborate ruses or forms of science that were unknown at the time in order to trick people into believing in these magical things that they were doing. But this is the same concept, is that you have this sort of hierarchy that comes about, and in this hierarchy there has to be priests, there has to be magicians to show the way. Well, and I think it's really interesting if you look at um, the Genesis myths of the Egyptian culture, their um, civilizer, Hermes or Thoth, he brought the arts of civilization, but also the arts of religion in the same character. You know, he was viewed as a messenger of the gods, but what did he bring from the gods? Civilization, right? So we have going back five, 6,000 years at least, this idea of the arts of civilization being a divinely inspired or religiously revealed idea. Well, and Hermes in Jewish tradition is commonly believed to be Enoch, which again built the pillars before the deluge. So all these stories start to tie in together, very similar to this, this concept of a foundation. And so with civilization being brought back into picture after some sort of deluge or some catastrophe, you have to reconstruct society. So you have to establish a hierarchy and there has to be religion, there has to be a priestcraft. And from there come the traders. Then comes commerce, then comes trade, and that's always the next natural stage of evolution, of which we see in the second degree a lot, which is this concept of one earning their wages and working. Yeah, and it's, it's interesting to me how he mirrors the, the grand evolution of humanity over the past 2,000 years or so. I mean, you could compare the Galactic Empire with the Roman Empire. And the, the Dark Age that followed the collapse of the Roman Empire with the Dark Age that he's portraying here. And, you know, you know in our day, it's very easy to uh, make fun of or degrade the contributions of religion to the human race in the past. But if we look at the, the Dark Ages specifically, the only reason we have literature and culture, well, maybe not the only reason, but a big part of the reason is because the Catholic Church devoted itself to creating essentially encyclopedias of human knowledge at the time and preserving them against the attacks of barbarians. These are the monks, you know, steeped in their books, uh, on a mountaintop in some sort of monastery, separated from everyone else. They're preserving, they're writing. They're understanding these texts for a certain time in history in which they can be reintroduced to the general public. Well, and I think it's, it's also really interesting because it's another great example of how knowledge and progress has to be brought to an uneducated populace in the guise of religion. Because religion awakens the emotional and the devotional aspects of the human psyche. So if you blend that with the intellect and with civilization and with progress, you'll end up getting people who are devoted and emotionally invested in the idea of reestablishing society. And if you look particularly at the Christian tradition, that is the mythology, right? That, that you know, onward Christian soldiers, we're going to go and, and build the new Jerusalem, which is essentially a metaphor for civilization, a more perfect civilization. Yeah, I really like that you brought that up, Brother Axel, because, you know, lately I hear everybody just, you know, uh, crapping all over religion, like it's a like it's, it's a terrible institution. It's enslaved mankind. 
You know, it's, it's done the most horrendous acts in human history. I'm not a real religious person in, ten, in terms of going to church or belonging to a particular sect, but I still find this nonsensical because the fact of the matter is religion is at the heart of humanity. I mean, there, there's, a, there's a certain part of the brain that lights up when we have, uh, you know, quote-unquote mystical activities, you know, experiences. And so we can't just take religion and throw it out because it's no longer necessary. We've grown beyond it. No, I don't believe that at all. You know, even when you look at an atheist culture, um, they still want places of community and they still have their own beliefs, their own creeds. It may be completely different from religion, but this idea of belief, which is at the forefront of religion, is something that is essential to all civilizations. There has to be common belief sets. Otherwise, what is it that holds this civilization together? You know, now that I think about it further, I don't know that they can be separated. I don't even know that they're necessarily different things. And civilization is a set of rituals by which people as generate a meaning out of their lives that is bigger than just themselves. Literally, by, like, by joining in with other people, using commerce and trade and community to enhance their lives and drive the species forward. That's essentially a religious impulse. It's a religious reaction to chaos and to the unknown, is to, is to band together in groups, which is the etymology of the word, religare, to bind back together. That's what we're doing with civilization. Civilization and religion are inseparable. It's the same process. But after religion comes commerce, comes trade. Because when you have this stability, mm -hmm. when you have roads that you can travel in peace, when there's some sort of common belief system, people start trading. And they start trading more and more to their own benefit. They start accumulating goods. They start gaining more wages. And their lives improve. The quality of life improves. And you see this in the foundation books in the later stages of the first novel in which these merchant princes arise. This is when we have more wealth. And I, I think um, Isaac Asimov is pointing at like Italy at this point. You know, mm -hmm. these merchant princes and these in these various the provinces, Venetians, the Venetians, yeah. the Medici, and what they're doing is that there's great accumulation of wealth going on. And this does trickle down to the people below, but it also creates some problems when you have such concentration of wealth. And this is an interesting thing that Asimov is working with here because he's demonstrating that a period of commerce and wealth acquisition is a necessary step in evolution, but it's not the end, you know? And this is something that I think we've lost sight of in today's society is the idea of, of capitalism, for example, as a wealth producing system that is to be used until it has exhausted its utility. It serves to get us from one point to another. And that point is when enough of the species is materially comfortable enough to move on to greater aspirations. Yeah, I would encourage everyone to look at all these stages like a pyramid. So psychohistory is the base of the pyramid. Then comes the encyclopedias. It's the knowledge that must be preserved. Then the next... Um, the next layer of this pyramid is religion, and following that is trade and commerce. But then where do we go from there? Well, if we go to the next book, which is Foundation and Empire, it's the sequel, there's somebody called the Mule. And the Mule's a real interesting character because you don't discover until the end who the Mule really is. It's just rumors everywhere of this great, this great leader who turns defeat into victory. And he can't, he's unstoppable. And what you find out is that the mule really is someone that cannot be calculated within the confines of psychohistory. Why? Because he's an individual. So psychohistory doesn't take into the effect this one mutant. I think it's interesting that he chooses a mutant to be this sort of um, this wild card because, in fact, he's almost like a genetic mutation, unpredictably entering the scene at a moment of somewhat stability and throwing everything off. And this is what evolves out of this period of commercialization right it be, it makes the individual an an agent in the in the scheme of civilization because civilization inherently has elements of tyranny within it that have to subdue the individual towards a greater end but once the powers of commerce become more and more distributed you get uh, societies that become 
individually fractured along the lines of individual sovereignty. And we're, we're starting to see this now, you know, in the West, this has been our tradition for several hundred years. But if we look in the wider world, this is starting to become the norm across what used to be called the third world now that their industrial revolutions have become completed and we're becoming a more individualistic culture globally another way of looking at it too is with the ashlers of masonry you know the the, the population is a rough ashler and and it needs to be made perfected and that perfection is found in the cube in the cubic stone. And this cubic stone is a symbol, I think, of the perfection of psychohistory. It's to try to calculate everything towards an ultimate utopian ending. But I'm not sure that it's actually plausible. I don't, I don't I think don't they mean it to be plausible. I, because you'll see this in Foundation, and I hope our listeners do go out and read it. There are layers of deception that have been left behind by Harry Seldon. It's not always clear that what he tells his followers to do is actually, you know, what they are there to do. Like there's there's Selden's plan and then there's what Selden's followers know of Selden's plan. And I think it's the same for human beings in our world that we have to be pushed towards these utopian visions that may or may not actually be feasible. That's not the point. Because, you know, there's that old cliche, if you shoot for the moon, at least if you miss, you might land among the stars. That's what you know, people with a greater vision of humanity's capability have pushed us towards. So maybe we don't reach these utopias, but at least we're in a better place than where we started. Well, if you look at the Masonic degrees too, as you go through the degrees, a story unravels. What you know as an apprentice is not what you learn as a 33rd degree Mason. And if you're a 33rd degree Mason, everything that you know, there's another layer beneath the surface story. And beneath that story is another story. It's, it's an unending level of symbolism that deeper and deeper penetrates into the psyche of humanity. So as you were saying, I'm not sure there is any end to it, but there is, it appears, like infinite layers of understanding and meaning. There are infinite layers. And I wonder if there is any intelligence out there that really does have the entire scope of the plan before them. You know, we work to um, the perfection of humanity and the glory of the great architect of the universe. But I wonder, as a creator, does the creator even understand where his creation is headed? Or would that remove some of the grandeur of the creation if it could be controlled and predicted and its fate predetermined? I think whenever you have a creator, there is an uncertainty towards its end. Because by creating something, you are giving it away. And I'll use an example. You could use Foundation. You could use any book. Just choose your favorite book and think about it. Did the author intend the meaning that you took from it? In some ways, when the author creates a masterpiece, they're giving it up to the people that read it. You know, They had their intentions, the things they put into it. But the meaning made of the stories written by authors in all ages... Not even the author could plan for such depth. No, it's almost like their only job is to offer a stepping stone. You know, we stand on the shoulders of giants. This has been true throughout human history. And, and even Asimov shows this in, in the Foundation series. There are events that come along that defy the knowledge of even the most advanced or far-seeing creator of any social movement or any tradition or religion. You know, we have the mule in the second book. Selden didn't predict for the mule. There was no way to predict for the mule. But what he did do was create a society and a tradition strong enough to overcome an unpredictable crisis. And I think that's what masonry is trying to do. It's trying to create, like you said, adaptable individuals individuals who can control their own mutation in response to environmental crisis, right? Those who can take control of their own evolution. Well, if we look at the list of, quote, famous Masons that we all look up to, you know, George Washington and Benjamin Franklin, so-and-so, what do we see? We see individuals that are highly adaptable, that they took a tumultuous situation, they adapted to it, they overcame it, and they trans muted it into something even greater. Why aren't we those people today? That's my question. Why do we always look back again, as we were talking about earlier in the show, to these people in the past? Not that we should forget them, 
Not that we shouldn't emulate them, but why aren't we doing that? Why are we living in an age that we only look backwards? Because we can only dwell in one place at a time. You know, this is kind of the 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 curse, in my opinion, of our of our current culture is that you have to be one thing. This is the problem with venerating the individual. Do you, do you mean specialization? I do mean specialization. So this is the problem with, as a good friend and brother of ours would say, the ascendancy of the individual. The individual is an individual. It's not malleable, right? The individual is a is a defined set of parameters that a person can fulfill. But when you say, I'm an individual, you're making a declaration about what you are, who you are, what you believe, and where the borders of all those things are. Those become impermeable if we don't allow for people to change their minds. And we don't. If you look at our political conversation, for example, you know how many times do we insult somebody for being a flip-flopper or for going back on a position they once held? But in our own lives, we feel ourselves completely entitled to change our mind when we find new information because we should. I mean, that's, that's the way of human progress is to change your mind, change your beliefs and your approach when things aren't working anymore. Well, it's pretty funny because when you think about it, we get upset for people because they don't change their mind. They're stuck in these views. And then we get upset at them when they do change their mind because they're <laughs> not consistent. So we're never happy whether they're stuck in their ideas or they're changing their minds. This is why we need great minds like Harry Seldon, honestly. And I'll go out on a bit of a limb here because most of us can't think for ourselves. We can't project into the future. We can't see crises that might be looming. I mean, even in my own life, there have been plenty of moments throughout my life where I should have seen a dark age, so to say, coming in my life that I was completely oblivious to because I was wrapped up in either looking in one direction or not looking at all. I think it's uncomfortable to stay in this, you know, this age of democracy and enlightenment of the common man. But, you know, uh, maybe I'm going a little too far. <laughs> this one. <laughs> no, you know, it's true. We can't think for ourselves. We're not responsible for our choices and for shaping society. You know, we sit around and we moan about, you know, the state of everything, the collapse that we're in the middle of. We, we look to our leaders to do something. How many people are out there actually enacting the change that they feel is necessary. Most of them are complaining and they're, they're waiting for somebody like Selden or for a movement to come along and to just tell them what to do. So I, I don't have a problem with that necessarily, but at least acknowledge yourself for what you are. Not only acknowledge yourself for what you are, but realize there are, there are forces at play here that we're not aware of. You know, there are people like Harry Seldon out there. There are groups making psychohistorical calculations as we speak towards the future of humanity. They're doing it economically. They're doing it politically. And we are just pawns in this great game. And that's where an institution like Freemasonry can have an impact. Because by gathering great minds, by gathering great people, and having a plan as how to impact society, how to create a dialogue, how to make a bridge between extremes. We can ourselves, in fact, become psychohistorians. I think you're saying what I was trying to express in a much more diplomatic manner, Brother Matthias, but you're right. If you are uncomfortable with the direction that society is headed, if you feel yourself to be a pawn, well, stop acting like a pawn. Find a plan, commit to it, find great minds, gather them together, do work. You know, this is the impulse that we've lost as, as people have strayed away from fraternalism is this idea of group work over a long period of time that you might not see the fruits of. And that's another thing I think we might have to reintroduce into society is that there are things worth working for that you won't necessarily see the end result of. I think that's the whole basis of Freemasonry. When you look at the various characters in the story, again, they never see their work. I mean, one particular architect never sees the completion of the first temple at Jerusalem that he put his life's work into. Nevertheless, he's a major character. Why? Because he did what he was supposed to do, and he did not bear the fruits of his labor. Well, and he had a plan to follow. And that's the thing that Masonry, I believe, gives people that come to its doors is there is a tradition it, it's somewhat relieving when you when you enter masonry and you know you complete the the progression of the blue lodge and you realize okay there is a project here that's been worked on for millennia 
There is a tradition. People have a plan. I might not know what that plan is, but at least somebody has a plan and it has been maintained over the centuries and we're going somewhere. That's a comforting thought in, in this day. Well, I'm, I'm going to go on, on, a, on a limb here and say that masonry is in its dark age and we are at a pivotal point. Are we going to have 30,000 years of darkness in masonry, so to say, or 1,000 years? And you know what the solution is? You know what terminus is? Co-masonry. Co-masonry is the advent of masonry coming out of the crucible of the last 300 years and morphing into an institution that's capable of taking on world-sized issues. Because if masonry is not careful, it may not be around in 100 years. So we need to adapt and we need to evolve right now. Or we're going to perish. You know, I'll take it even a step further than you, Brother Matthias. Mainstream mailcraft masonry is on the brink of death. It's happening. They know it. We know it. The entire world knows it. Their membership is declining. Their, their ritual, their practice, there's no air of seriousness to it. And they say this. And, you know, when, when we travel around, when we, you know, uh, present for the Masonic Philosophical Society or wherever we go. We talk to Malecraft Masons and they say the same thing. You know, I don't find what I'm looking for anymore. There's no philosophy. There's no ritual in my lodge anymore. We meet and we pay bills. That's not going to save humanity. Debating on whether or not to pay the light bill is not going to bring us out of the dark age in a thousand years. That's going to keep us in the dark age for 30,000 years. Well, listen to the other podcasts in Freemasonry. You know, one of my favorite shows is Ex Oriente. The guys do a great job on that show of trying to break through the stagnation of male craft masonry. But if you listen to their content, you can tell they're frustrated too with the, with the current state of masonry. And this isn't, I don't think, our prediction necessarily. Our idea is we hear from the mouth of the lion, so to say. But in the end, you're absolutely right. We're facing a, a Harry Seldon crisis, which in the book... Every certain amount of years, there's accumulation of events that ends in a crisis. That if the crisis is not met perfectly, means doom for terminus in the encyclopedias, traders, merchant princes, etc. And right now is a Selden crisis. Right now, this very moment as we speak, we are at this crisis point. And if we don't learn how to cross over it, all of masonry is dead. Even crow masonry will be sucked into the abyss with mailcraft masonry. You're giving me chills right now, Brother Matthias. But it's true. Like the, And Mailcraft Masonry did a great service to the world. This is not to say that everything about the organization is wrong or has been a detriment. They embraced the empirical system, the empire system of spreading masonry. Without Mailcraft Masonry as reconstituted in 1717, we wouldn't have masonry all over the world. You know, it wouldn't be a part of the consciousness of humanity. And for that, they performed a great service. But just like with every stage of Terminus in the Foundation series, their time has come to an end. And the next formation of the same plan has to step into the breach. We're not saying that, you know, old Mailcraft Masonry is bad. Co-Masonry is the way to be. No, times have changed. The world has changed. Masonry must change. So if we go back to the idea of the pyramid I was talking about, in which there are various you know, levels moving up towards the, the capstone or the peak or apex, well, Mailcraft Masonry is one of those levels. And it did a tremendous job, a wonderful job, of bringing the ideals of liberty, equality, fraternity, of inculcating esotericism and the occult into general society. It, it, it created a place for people to come talk about different ideas without getting chastised and beat down. But now it's time to go to the next level. And that next level is a masonry that is composed of all people, regardless of race, religion, gender, creed. Absolutely. I mean, this is, we have to reflect how humanity has changed. I mean, we exist to serve humanity as Masons, all, all Masons, not just co-Masons, but all of Masonry exists for the betterment of the species. If we don't adapt to the needs of the species, then we're not doing what we say we want to do. So, so I got a question for you, uh, Brother Axel. Do you think co-Masonry is the mule, the mutant that was unpredicted? Of course, Brother Matthias. 
How could it be any other way? We emerged from nowhere, from nothing, you know, to become a, a new powerhouse. I, you know, not to toot our own horn too loudly, but I, there's a reason we have Mailcraft Masons who come to us and who are astounded at what we're doing. I mean, for one thing, we're incorporating the other half of the human race that has been left out of the conversation for centuries at this point. I don't know how we're going to save humanity if we're not allowing half of humanity to participate in that saving. And in some ways, when you look at this entire situation of Maser today, it's teaching us a lesson. You know, this is part of the Masonic curriculum, so to say. We have to have these little crises. This is how we improve. We shouldn't be fearful of the moment. We should be embracing of the moment. This is evolution. People don't get it sometimes. That at every moment of our lives, we are being challenged, not for ill, but for the positive sake of our own self-development. Without friction, the Ashlar never becomes perfect, and psychohistory is never actualized. Well, people don't recognize the work of evolution usually when they're the stagnant piece of whatever species it is that won't respond adequately to the crisis and i feel like that's that's a lot of what's going on not just in masonry but across the world it seems like in everything that we have at politics economics all of our institutions we are being challenged across the board you know and masonry i think we would do well to remember that masonry is not exempt from this challenge. Every institution is being faced with its karmic record, so to speak, of the last few centuries and, and whether or not it can adapt to how the human race is changing into the 21st century. The final part of the foundation stories is an interesting concept, which is something called the second foundation. And the second foundation, that second column we were talking about, is a very small group of people that have the ability to read minds and to speak to one another sort of telepathically, so to say. And so Isaac Asimov has a real interesting concept here that the second foundation is really the one controlling the whole thing. This, the first foundation is the foot soldiers. It's doing all the material work, but it's the second foundation doing the quote-unquote spiritual work, so to say. They're the ones that are tweaking people's minds, and they're keeping the course of psychohistory. And so if we apply this to today, it's kind of what we've been talking about, is that in all groups, there are a few people that run it, whether it's in a Masonic Lodge. Everybody here that's a Mason knows what I'm talking about. If you have 50 members, how many people are doing all the work? What, 10%, 5%? You go to a company, you go to a church, wherever you go, how many people are actually the ones running it and keeping it alive. It's not everyone. It's not even half. It's not three quarters. It's, it's probably 90 to 95% of people are just going to go through the motions and a very few people are the ones benefiting from this. So in the second foundation, you have the same concept. They're the ones calling the shots, but nobody really knows who they are. And I think that's the true sign of a worker. Someone that isn't getting all the accolades, medals, and recognition because probably they're not doing the work. They just want to get all those shiny little bling. It's those who work silently and diligently without any attachment to the completion of their work that are really going to carry the species forward. So in conclusion, we would really recommend everyone that, uh, that hasn't read these books, go read them. They're short, they're easy read. And if you look at it through the Masonic lens, you're going to get so much knowledge out of these books. And again, you know, what we espouse is our own opinions. Yeah, after that rant, I would definitely uh, add that these are, of course, our own personal opinions. But like Brother Matias said, please go out, go read uh, Isaac Asimov. He's got uh, something like 30 or 40 books. They're all fantastic. And get into science fiction. Get inspired. Think about the future. Let's not just... You know, go through our lives looking at the past accomplishments of people that were greater than us, but instead look towards the future and ask yourself, what future can you help create? Thank you for listening to Legends of the Craft. This podcast is purely the opinion of brothers Matthias Comcier and Axel Suvari and does not represent the official views of Universal Clemason. Universal Clemasonry is a Masonic order founded on the principles of liberty, equality, and fraternity that admits men and women without distinction of race, 
religion, or creed. For more information, please visit universalfreemasonry.org.